Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Grab those glasses. In less than two weeks, a total solar eclipse will cut a path across 13 states. And millions of people across North America will witness at least a partial solar eclipse on Monday. A solar eclipse will darken the skies across the United States as the moon passes between the sun and Earth. Seatbelts fastened and carrying up items put away until the captain turns off the seatbelt sign. Be careful when opening overhead bins as items tend to move during flight. Back in New York, seems like I've never gone too long. This time would be for sort of a different reason though. The 2024 eclipse was coming up and I had never experienced a total solar eclipse before. So like the warm god emperor Leto II, I saw the golden path laid out before me and I knew what I had to do. Fly out to New York and then road trip somewhere to see the damn thing. Of course, Leto II didn't have to deal with a 400 pound telephoto lens in his carry-on that TSA thought was a missile. So they cavity searched the crap out of him, but you know, Hopefully the trouble would all be worth it. The plan was that David, Birgit, and I were gonna hop in a car and cruise out to totally view totality. You may or may not remember David and Birgit from the Pacific Northwest trip last year. Well, it's the same ones. Anyway, at the time I was kind of down bad and needed a win photographically. My last two shoots didn't exactly go well. Not because I'm an incompetent photographer with a long history of fuck ups or anything like that, but uh, you know, technical issues or whatever people say to reassign blame. One shoot was a uh, semi rained out and the other had some, I guess, mechanical problems, but whatever, this isn't the place to get into it. Doesn't matter now. I was in New York and live in La Vida Loca or whatever Ricky said. With time to kill, I figured I'd stop by that, you know, retro TWA hotel that costs like, $2 million a night to stay at. They probably didn't want a dirty, broke-ass film photographer like me wandering around the lobby taking photos, but that's what I did anyway. Also worth mentioning was that I was kind of taking a chance and leaning into a new focal length, at least for me, 50 millimeters. I purchased the Nikkor 50 millimeter 1.2 and I've definitely been having a slight suspicion lately that 50 millimeter might be the focal length for me. But whatever, let's stop talking about it and find out. Honestly, I was kind of expecting better from these photos, which is something you'll probably say about this video when it's over. I don't know, you know, some of these shots have blown highlights. Maybe the contrast and dynamic range was just a bit too much for, you know, the limited dynamic range of slide film. And it just became overwhelmed with photons, like me with tears when I listened to Taylor Swift's new album. The shot is good enough. I kinda missed focus, but ah well, all's well that ends well, I guess. Which this did not actually. They caught me sneaking a photo of them and beat the shit out of me while everyone in the lobby applauded. Not for nothing though, these were some good warm up shots. You know, the shots that you kind of take just to get in the zone a little bit, hypothetically, theoretically. Anyway, after train surfing my way to Birgit's place because I'm too broke for the train fare, what with shooting Ektachrom and all, I dropped my shit off and went into the city because I needed some more film. Of course, I brought my F2 with me and did the, you know, customary nod of approval to everyone who walked by packing a Leica. After I grabbed some Kenmere 400, I took a quick train up to the Radio City Music Hall. I've always wanted to shoot it, and I figured I had two seconds, so why the hell not? The 
The shots are not okay. This is probably the best one. Other than, of course, the word radio is kind of cropped. But this shit is photographed 200 million times a day. So I guess I felt like I had to put my own illiterate spin on it somehow. Of the 36 exposure roll of Kodak Ektachrome E100, I got 18 keepers and one, maybe two portfolio shots. Okay, one. Eventually David picked up Birgit and I and we were off to the races and by races I mean something far less exciting like Ohio. It was between Ohio and upstate New York for this shindig. The path of totality went to both places but the weather forecast was kind of all over the place like fresh roadkill. One day upstate New York was clear, you know, no clouds and then the next day it wasn't and instead Ohio was clear. Then like the next day Ohio was 40% cloud coverage. It changed like every two seconds so we just said ah at least our buddies Trev and Hannah were in Ohio and it'd be a lot of fun to see them though of course we'd first have to cross the wastelands of rural Pennsylvania. The trees they are singing to the tune of a song. At the first charging station, I sat alone, like I was eating lunch in high school or something. And I loaded up some Camir 400 because I've actually been loving pushing that stuff to 3200 lately. Does it look like I'm doing drugs over here? Definitely. <laughs> Throw an orange filter in there and uh, who freaking knows what would happen. We're about to find out. The voice of the robin, the call of the dove, the red leaves are falling, the barn owl is calling, the welcome of the dawn. Anyway, I was cast out to the back seat by Birgit and David because of that thing I said that was so fucked up it can't be repeated here. But after another hundred miles or so, it was time for lunch somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. At a place that had a cow mounted to the wall that you can do hand stuff to. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it doesn't really seem like it's the biggest fan of it. <laughs> Several hours and billions of miles later, we took a random exit that took us deep into the woods from Blair Witch or something. Eventually we found what we were looking for, the Frank Lloyd Wright Falling Water House. And it certainly had water that was falling, mostly from my eyes though, because it was beautiful. That's why it's called Falling Water. We couldn't go in, but the surrounding property was pretty cool. It's not something you see every day. 
if I'm being honest, I didn't really understand the river toilet, but I guess that's just an architecture thing. A, you know, regular bathroom probably would have been preferable. Though, to be frank myself, hold the Lloyd right, the 35mm lens on the F2 just wasn't cutting it. I was craving the 50 again, like some sort of focal length crack addict wandering around in the woods, which honestly at that moment I was realistically only like one step away from being. Yeah, so believe it or not, folks, that isn't a 6x17 camera David is wielding. It's something far, far more dangerous. It's a 6x24 camera, which gives you like three shots, I think, on a roll of 120. You know, something like that. And because David is on some other photography astral plane above us mortals, he also shot slide film. We still had many miles east to cover as we were likely only halfway through Pennsylvania, so we hopped back in the D-Mobile and kept going. Eventually we found a place to crash. Not the car, but like our weary souls or something poetic like that. at the hotel. I drew the short straw, I guess, because it's funnier that way. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Sick. You, but how are you gonna watch the movie? If we actually watch that movie. What the hell else are we gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny, that was like my breaking point. <laughs> <laughs> I got to sleep on a bed that I can only describe as a bed they would probably put soldiers from World War One on about to die from trench foot because they probably have bigger issues to worry about than, you know, springs prison shanking their kidneys in the middle of the night. <laughs> anyway, after slapping the shit out of each other, only for David to win every round, somehow. We went to sleep and only ever woke up to some people playing dodgeball in the hallway at 4 a.m. for some reason. But, you know, we were excited. Who knew exactly what the next day or two held for us? The eclipse was tomorrow and we still had many, many miles to cover. But speaking of cover, there wasn't any clouds. So we we're kind of, you know, feeling optimistic in that moment. Anyway, after breakfast, we finally left Raspberry, Pennsylvania, or whatever it's called, and headed west. Only ever stopping to see one of the Great Lakes, so we could judge for ourselves how great it really is. There's this lighthouse that was being lit up quite Edward Hopperian esquely and we all knew what we had to do. So I dug deep down in my bag and pulled out the 300 millimeter lens and two times extender I'd borrowed from my friend Ryan to get the job done. <laughs> you see it? Yes. Anyway, feeling like the sexiest bird photographer of the goddamn decade. I took some shots of the lighthouse and they're okay-ish. I also took some bird photos, but that shit is hard. I don't know how you all do it. Turns out, black and white, maybe not the move here. Color, I think, would have slayed. The roof of the lighthouse being, you know, the complementary color to the water and all. 
Birgit actually nailed it on the RB, I think. Check it out on our Instagram if you have one of those. I'm sure David killed it too, but he was shooting digital, so who gives a f of the 36 exposure roll of Camir 400 it pushed to 3200 in the F2. I got like 13 keepers and maybe one or two portfolio shots. All I really know is that 13 for 36 is not a great photographic to economy ratio. There we go again. It's the Pacific Northwest all over again. No more Camp Mirror in the F2, I decided to go back to color and load up some hand-rolled 250D that I got off eBay, the black market of cinema film. I still didn't really know what I was going to shoot for the eclipse, if we even got an eclipse at all. The cloud cover was looking sporadic and not so promising. But at least this group shot is cute as fuck, so there's that. Eventually, we finally arrived in Ohio and met up with Trev, Hannah, and their daughter Stevie, as well as Casey from GX Ace. But with three o'clock fastly approaching, we grabbed all of our photo crap and headed out to our Eclipse location for a quick test setup to make sure everything was Gucci, hold the Prada. But the next day was the Eclipse and we only have like four minutes to capture totality, you know, cloud cover permitting. This location is actually quite steeped in Ohioian lore, sort of. Trev works for the dark room and he shoots at this location quite a bit, so it was, you know, a little surreal to see it in person. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a field with a tree, which is kind of what I imagine most of Ohio is, but it was cool nonetheless, and this photo is good. off a test shot of the sun doing its thing, you know, giving people sunburns and whatnot. And the photo itself has some sort of blobular bounce back going on. I'm sure that's the scientific term for it. I'm not exactly sure where it's coming from, but it could be an issue the next day. Obviously at the time I was blissfully unaware of this artifact. It wasn't showing in the viewfinder, only on the film. Back here first thing tomorrow for the eclipse. That night, though nervous about the eclipse, I slept like a baby. Not in the literal sense, I didn't cry myself to sleep and then shit myself this time. But I woke up definitely ready for action. The morning of the eclipse was definitely tense, to say the least, if for nothing else because Trev was dangling aerochrome in front of me like a worm for a fish. There was definitely some cloud cover that morning, and we even got a little bit of rain the night prior, so we were certainly concerned that our travels would be almost for nothing. Perhaps as a way to, I guess, alleviate some of the stress. I neurotically changed the batteries on my Nikon F2 just to make sure everything was, you know, cooking by the book. You know, the little John version.
This shot is cool because it definitely looks like Birgit and David are about to drop the chillest indie folk album of the decade. Anyway, we head into downtown to pick up some coffee and a 4x5 lens for David, but also maybe put things at ease and shoot some small town street corners or whatever we do with these film cameras. This shot, good. I like how layered it is and how the subjects go from, you know, silhouetted Casey to in the light beer get. Never hurts to throw in an old school looking diner as well, even if Trev was ruining all my B-roll of it. Hey! Of the 36 exposure roll of 250D in the F2, I got 17 keepers and maybe one portfolio shot. This one ain't bad either. The color and the lighting are good. I just don't know if it's, you know, a subject that I care enough about. Anyway, because there is no room in the car, some people had to ride dirty in the back. But in an epic battle for the front seat, Trev and I rochambeaued like two war tacticians arm wrestling for dominance. Scissors again or not? I'm gonna do scissors. Okay. Mind games. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. Rock, paper. <laughs> <laughs> Are you shooting on them? Like, doing video on them? Yeah. The whole video. Are you actually? Yeah. Nice. Is that a DV? Uh, it's mini DV, yeah, top tier quality. That's awesome. Oh, dude, look at this lens flare on you right now. Oh, Anamorphic, baby. Uh, and I'm putting the 400D in the in my Ektar container, so. Sacrilegious. Have you seen those? Here you go, David. It's beating time. <laughs> Your time. Yeah. I, I'm worried because you have so many things. Take my time, I have no time. After picking up some euros the size of a baby, we headed to the location to get ready. And in an absolute display of power, Trev somehow housed the entire damn sandwich in one go. Is that good? You don't have any of it on your face. <laughs> Regardless, we all knew what was coming and we had to be on our game. The clock was certainly ticking. After all, you only get one shot at mom's spaghetti or whatever Eminem said. Basically, we had to be perfect and the cloud cover wasn't exactly in our favor, but at least we could see the sun. Damn, you just, you had a moment where you looked like Robert Pattinson exactly. As an added unwelcomed curveball, there was some wind present as well. This is a problem because super long telephoto lenses are incredibly sensitive to any movement or outside vibrations, and wind is a common threat in those cases. Anyway, we took a commemorative photo that I'm sure one day we'll all be looking at 20 years in the future when the next eclipse happens in the US. And I ran to get my camera in a very manly way. For totality itself, I decided on some 250D and I had a roll from Atlanta Film Co. ready to go. I figured cinema film would have some, you know, slight halation, which might be cool. And it's very latitude economic, I guess you could say. If I missed exposure by like two or three stops, maybe it would hold up. Who knows? Though honestly, the plan was just to bracket the ever loving shit out of this roll anyway. With a little bit of time on our hands, I decided to pop off a shot on the 300mm with a 2 times extender, hereby referred to as a 600mm, you know, like this was a legal document or something. So I guess the issue is the f2 prism I have is old as balls, and this lens isn't 100% compatible with it. It works. I mean, don't get me wrong. I just had to use stop-down metering to get accurate readings. Luckily, I'm kind of used to it with my Leica R35-70, to but for showtime, my sh definitely had to be dialed in. So I totally assassinated this photo of a barn from like 100 miles away because 600 mil is pretty freaking intense. 
Going into this, I was really only interested in capturing three photos of the eclipse, and I was prepared to sacrifice an entire roll of 250D to do it. One of a, I guess a half eclipse, like that really cool shot from Dune Part 2, the dune -ing. and then one of a, I guess an almost full eclipse, like it's edging or something, and then, you know, finally, uh, totality. Luckily for us, it seemed like the clouds that were moving in were thinner than one plied gas station toilet paper. So like a finger, we were able to poke our lenses through and see the sun. Just, you know, with a little bit of diffusion from the clouds. Think of it like a one quarter pro mist. Anyway, for some reason with like 10 minutes to go before the moon starts to, you know, canvas the sun, I got a nosebleed. What the hell is that about? I can't even remember the last time I had one, you know, outside of Film Photography Fight Club in Kodak Rochester's basement. Invite only, don't DM me. So, here's the first shot where it's barely crossing the sun. It's kind of cool, especially because there is some cloud texture, but oh no, that blobular bounce back is still there, kinda. Truthfully, I don't know what was causing it, but it went away, so whatever. Anyway, here's the dune shot, if you want to call it that. More or less a 50% eclipse. Like if Pac-Man was getting ready to hole mouth a cheeseburger or something like that, that little freak. Maybe wondering why these are so orange, like I shot them on red scale or something. For some reason, whatever reason, leaning these images warm in post definitely hid a lot of the grain that was on these shots. So I kind of just leaned into it and said, yes, chef. It may also look to you in this video like I nailed these shots on the first try, but that is absolutely not the case. You're seeing the best of you know, probably seven or eight different bracketed shots at each stage of the eclipse. Keep in mind the entire roll is 36 exposures and I'm only showing like four shots. So without a doubt, the worst roll to portfolio ratio ever. Anyway, with the light growing fractionally fainter, I pop this off. The edging shot, I guess you can call it. I can't think of a better name for it. Either way, I like it a lot. firing every split second making sure to bracket but you know what the coolest part was the in-between just admiring how weirdly and frankly hold the lloyd right again dark it was that's so cool a gold it was definitely dramatic it was more dramatic than anyone had told me it would be and in that moment i understood why people chase these down across the globe and why ancient people in the sixth century or sometime around there stopped stabbing each other and made a truce at the battle of the Halys river probably because they saw night turn to day during an eclipse shat their armor and thought the world was ending four minutes later and time was up and we were all just in this like euphoric high like we just dropped a load of acid or something. It was incredible. And we were all hoping we got the shot. A lot of us there were shooting film, so we wouldn't really know for a few days or weeks, which was some sort of torture we all kind of knowingly subjected ourselves to. And best of all, David got his totality shot on raw four x five film. Here's my shot of totality. I think it's good. I love the colors, the glowy halation and the gradient from light to darkness that kind of surrounds it. Hopefully it doesn't get absolutely railroaded by YouTube's compression. Is it a portfolio shot? Sure, I guess. Everyone has an eclipse shot nowadays, so it isn't really special, but whatever. On a technical level, it's kind of cool. Bra how many bracketed shots did you- Oh, dude. Yeah, I took like 15. Yeah. Anyway, afterwards, beer good head, possibly the best post-eclipse idea. What's the, uh, Want a beer? And if I'm being honest, those post-eclipse Ohio field beers, they hit a little differently. Okay. 
So that was that. No sense in waiting around for the next one. We packed up and just like that f***ing rabbit every spring, we headed Easter, just like everyone else in the state of Ohio, apparently. We said bye to Trev, Hannah, and Stevie, and we totally weren't crying. You're crying. The 250D burned through, hopefully with pictures of the Eclipse, I certainly had no idea at that point. I loaded up some more ectochrome as we headed into Pennsylvania to visit a waterfall at sunset. After finally not sleeping on a Great Depression era jankety ass hotel bed, we explored wherever the hell we were in Pennsylvania. We found the super cool collapsing depot station thing with hot sausage available in our area. This photo feels very, you know, stand by me for whatever reason, probably just the train and general flat rural feel of everything. Unfortunately, we didn't find any dead bodies. We all took this photo of a BK sign overlooking the suburbs and I don't think mine came out very good. But I don't know, maybe it's one of those symbolic photos more than it's about the colors and composition. Like the fearless Mad Max off-road paint huffers that we are, David took the Tesla on some OHV back roads as we continued to commute back to New York City. Eventually we stopped in, you know, somewhere, Pennsylvania, I don't know, to get coffee and stretch our legs.
I only took three photos or so to finish off the roll of Ectochrome, but I think they're pretty great. This photo feels very Edward Hopper to me, somehow. Maybe the colors and transition from dark to light. I don't know. Very special shout out to this shot though, and it's colors. I don't know what yesterday's prices is, and I'm really hoping it's not a strip club, but I do like the framing quite a bit. Of the 36 exposure roll of Kodak Ektachrome in the Nikon F2, I got 20 keepers and five, maybe six portfolio slammers. I don't know, that might be a record for me. After that, we hopped in the T-Wagon and headed east to New York City. And yeah, of course we made it A-OK. -okay. We didn't really know if our shots from the eclipse would turn out, but the suspense was fine and totally not killing us on the inside. Because at the end of the day, it was just kind of a fun detour with some of the coolest friends I have. I am always inspired when I'm around these people, so hopefully we get to do more like this in the future. Before we actually left Ohio, we took a commemorative photo where Birgit did some Doctor Strange mirror dimension shit and pulled off a really creative image. That's the kind of thing that gets me, you know, photographically inspired by being around people that I guess think outside of the box. But speaking of boxes and their square shapedness, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Need a website fast? I bet you do. It's the digital era after all, and at the heart of it is the internet. So let me introduce you to your new best friend, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website building platform that features the ability to truly unlock your creative potential. If you'd like to turn your business, hobby, or career into something greater, you can start by building your own online empire through various available modules like member areas, a monetized way to give exclusive access to content not otherwise seen by the general public. If you're a photographer like me in need of some space to build an online portfolio, then look no further than the tools available to you through through Squarespace. You can get started building the portfolio of your dreams with something called Blueprint AI, a new feature in Squarespace's website building toolkit. Blueprint AI is an automated way to generate the foundation of your website by answering a few simple questions at the get-go and letting the algorithm figure out the rest for you. With 1.4 billion potential design combinations and the brand new Fluid Engine, a sleek new way to drag and drop elements of your website wherever at your disposal, it basically assures you that no two websites will be alike. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today at squarespace.com slash grainy days. And if you use the code grainy days at checkout, you can get 10% off your first purchase. Oddly enough, I think I would have been pretty happy with a lot of the photos I took in this video, even if the solar eclipse ended up being a bust. I mean, don't get me wrong. This shot is sick and this alternate is too. But yeah, it's always more about the journey, as cheesy as that is. The stuff in between was cool, you know? That's the beauty of a road trip. You kind of just find a bunch of random shit and you end up walking away with something that you never thought was possible. Good photos. I mean, they're not gonna win a Pulitzer Prize or anything, but yeah, you know, they're right up my alley. Is 50 millimeters the uh, move from here on out? It might be. Certainly for run and gun type stuff, it, it could be, yeah. I don't think I'm gonna invest and change all my gear overnight, but I'll start to work into my process a bit more. Anyway, that's about it. And to answer your burning question, no, we did not get Taco Bell.